It's a real honor to be able to introduce Michael. I've known Michael a long time and just going through his the uh, sort of stated bio. You know, Michael's interesting because his background is in physics. I mean, he got his PhD in physics uh, from Stanford. He worked as a sort of a physicist slash engineer when he was at Bell Labs. And so when he came here, he was one of a, uh, I would say kind of a select cohort of kind of scientists, engineers that I think fit particularly well in the department who was able to bring this, uh, an experimental preparation in the study of songbird and songbird learning uh, to general questions of computation. That is how our songs learns, how is sequence learning engaged and how can it be probed in a system that arguably is even more challenging than the, the, the rat and perhaps the mouse. And that is the songbird that uh, is challenging to actually do in vivo electrophysiology in general but specifically to do in vivo electrophysiology in a behaving animal that has to engage in ethologically appropriate behavior like singing. And so that I think tapped the, all of the, 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 the training and resources that Michael developed as a physicist and engineer. And I think what uh, really distinguishes his work for me is both the insight and dedication to the development of technologies. And he's developed incredible, you know, novel, uh, um, uh, methods to allow him to interrogate the system. We've collaborated with him as well, trying to, uh, trying to, you know, squeeze what little, uh, you know, tidbits we can to apply to our own research. But in doing so, applying these methodologies to record from the system, he's able to use the background in physics to think about and develop uh, computational models, which can be tested using the engineering leveraged experimental preparation of the songbirds. So, you know, all together, it really is a, uh, a powerful, but also unique opportunity to ask fundamental questions about not just learning, but specifically about sequence learning. And as he's been looking at more recently, how uh, uh, the role of reinforcement and reinforcement learning in, the, uh, in both the development of song and as how, how it may also relate uh, to our general uh, learning of sequences, motor sequences, uh, speech. Uh, and I think I covered just about everything, except uh, in addition to his capacity as, and uh, you know, I wanna get this, I wanna get this right as the, so the Glenn Phyllis uh, uh, Dorflinger Professor of Brain and Cognitive Science. He's also recently our new department head. And he said, our department head at a time when we are making a transition to uh, sort of a greater, greater embrace through the College of Computing, the integration of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the general uh, uh, integration of computation throughout MIT. And in his earlier capacities, the associate department head, Michael was instrumental in bringing together our new EECS, BCS uh, major, this what we refer to the 6-9 major, which has dramatically changed the undergraduate culture, which also served to create an environment uh, that bridges and will soon literally bridge college of computing, brain and cognitive science. So it's sort of ushering this new era of computationally uh, focused, uh, let's say uh, sort of model inspired uh, biology and neuroscience. And for that, that's a sort of a perfect uh, fit for CBMM for this talk. And so he's going to give us his insights into the latest work on temporal state space. Something, something, something or other. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great to uh, be here. It's great to be a part of CBMM. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, mission that, that um, resonates uh, very much with my own uh, research interests and, and my own passion. So it's great to be a part of this uh, community. Um, okay, so, so our lab is interested in understanding how the brain generates and learns complex sequential behaviors. These are behaviors that most of us think are uniquely human, like speech and language and music and athletic performance. Uh, these are examples of behaviors where the brain has to generate a very uh, uh, precise sequence of motor gestures. Those gestures have to be produced with very precise timing and temporal ordering for those behaviors to be successful. Uh, those, uh, those behaviors are, are also um, learned through a lot of practice. Um, 
uh, thousands of repetitions of those behaviors we have to undergo. We try out different things. We, uh, we discard the things that don't work well and we keep the things that work well. Um, those behaviors are also learned um, largely by imitation. We watch other people do those things and we store a model of what looks right in those behaviors and those models, those internal models guide our, uh, our practice. So our lab works to uh, figure out how those things work at the level of neural circuitry in the brain using the songbird as a model system. Uh, the animal that we study is the zebra finch. Uh, zebra finches are sort of the lab rat of the songbird field. They've, um, they're uh, studied ex extensively um, in, in uh, um, uh, their brains and their behavior. Uh, zebra finches produce a, a characteristic song that sounds like this. So they have a brief introductory note that they produce a few of sort of clearing their throat. Uh, then they uh, produce a song motif that has five to three to seven uh, distinct song syllables. And that motif gets repeated over and over again. The motif itself lasts about a second. Uh, the syllables last about a tenth of a second. And there are distinct notes within those syllables that are very precisely reproduced. Um, each one of those syllables is separated by a brief gap in which the bird takes a, a 30 millisecond long breath so that they can keep singing continuously. Okay, let me just play a couple more examples of, of uh, zebra finch songs. You can hear that repetitive uh, motif structure. This one's particularly jazzy. Okay. So uh, zebra finches learn their song through a series of stages that in some ways resembles uh, humans, uh, uh, the process by which humans learn speech. Uh, there's an early sensory stage at which uh, the young bird here, uh, this is a 35 day old male zebra finch that's listening to um, the male tutor song in the background. They listen to that tutor song uh, over the course of a few weeks. They form a memory of what that tutor song sounds like after which they don't need to actually be around the, uh, the parent or the tutor anymore. Uh, they begin to babble, producing um, highly variable vocalizations that I'll play for you in a second. Uh, by listening to themselves sing, they gradually refine their vocalization until they can produce what's a pretty, in the end, can be a pretty good copy of the tutor song. So here is an example progression of the uh, vocalization of one young bird after it hears this tutor song. So let me just play these for you. So here's the tutor song that this young bird hears. Okay, at an early age, um, uh, you know, 35 to 40 days of age, uh, these, uh, this young bird produces babbling. So this is called sub song. So that's a baby bird babbling. Then after a few days, you start seeing a rhythmic repetitive structure within the song. And that's called the, those are called protosyllables and that's called the protosyllable stage. So you, see, you hear this, you'll hear this, boop, 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 this sort of uh, 10 Hertz rhythm that emerges. Okay, and then a few days later, you start seeing distinct syllable types emerge. Okay, and then, a few days later, or a few weeks later, the bird is practicing thousands of times a day during this period. And a few weeks later, the bird <laughs> produces an adult song that can sound <laughs> a lot like the tutor song. Okay. All right. So how does all this happen? So one of the most prominent ideas in the field about how song learning occurs in songbirds um, is the idea of reinforcement learning. So the idea is that there's a song motor system that produces um, a vocalization, that drives a vocalization at the output. So here's a babbling song. The bird then listens to, uh, sorry, each time the bird sings, that song has to be a little bit different because the bird is trying out different things, okay? Then um, each time the bird sings, it's comparing that its own song using auditory feedback to the stored uh, tutor memory, okay? That's somewhere, we don't know exactly yet where that is in the, um, in the brain, but um, then that auditory feedback gets compared to the auditory memory to produce a reinforcement or an error signal that goes back and modifies 
uh, the song motor system so that the bird then eventually produces a good copy. Okay. Now, one of the um, one of the key challenges of reinforcement learning is that um, is that is is building what's called the state space of the problem. Okay. So, for example, if an action, if the outcome of an action depends on where you are when that action happens or when that action occurs, okay, then the brain has to have a representation for space or time in order to, uh, in order to engage reinforcement learning successfully. Okay? And in the songbird, the relevant state space that needs to be represent, represented is the time within the song. Okay? All right, so here's what I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so I'm going to start by briefly describing um, these neural sequences that, uh, that underlie song production. So this state space, this time within the song is represented by a small population of neurons in a particular area that is the vocal premotor cortex of the, of the songbird. So I'll describe the neural sequences that form that state space for the reinforcement learning problem, okay, and actually drive the vocal output. I'll then turn to a uh, hypothesis or, or sort of our working model for how uh, the brain implements reinforcement learning, okay? And then finally, I'll describe how those sequences that drive the vocal output, that represent time within the song, emerge during development, okay? So we'll see how those sequences that represent time within the song arise as the bird develops um, through that learning process, okay? All right, so the brain areas that are involved in producing the song uh, are outlined here. So this is the motor pathway as it's referred to. The vocal organ is down here. It has six, six or seven muscles on each side of the vocal organ. Those muscles are innervated by 3,000 or so motor neurons in the brainstem, or that, you know, just like motor neurons in our spinal cord. Those neurons get direct input from a chain of four brain nuclei that are in a part of the avian, um, avian brain that's analogous or maybe homologous, there's, the, there's still some uncertainty about the relation to uh, mammalian neocortex. Okay, so we think of this, these as the, um, as the song motor cortex in the bird. Okay, there is a feedback pathway uh, from, uh, from this uh, layer five like area of, of the motor cortex down to the midbrain, to the thalamus and back to HVC. Um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about this loop today, but um, it's been shown to be uh, important for song production. So I'll start by showing you some recordings of neurons in these brain areas. Songbirds are very small. Uh, singing in adults is a, uh, is a mating behavior. So the birds have to be pretty happy in order to sing. So we developed this very small, uh, lightweight microdrive that's uh, motor controlled. So you can uh, turn a dial and find neurons essentially by remote control. So if you record from neurons in this layer five output part of motor cortex, you find neurons that generate 10, eight to 10 or so brief bursts of, of spikes. And each time the bird sings its song motif, that pattern of spikes is very precisely reproduced. And each neuron produces a distinct pattern of bursts that's very precisely reproduced on each repetition of the song. Okay, so these are the bursts of activity that project down and control the motor neurons in the brainstem. Okay, so there's a complex sequence of bursts. Now, we wanted to ask, where does that complex pattern of bursts come from? So we started going upstream to record from neurons in HVC that project down to RA to ask, how are those bursts driven? And we found these really interesting neurons that generate a single burst of spikes on each repetition of that song motif. Okay, so um, you can see three repetitions of the motif and that neuron generates three distinct high frequency bursts of spikes, each one of them uh, six millisecond, about six milliseconds long. If you record from a whole bunch of those neurons in the same bird, you can uh, put them together in a pseudo population using the song as a temporal alignment. 
And you can see that each one of those neurons is generating a single burst of spikes at one moment of the song and different neurons are active at different times in this one, okay? Um, you might ask, is that song completely tiled with these neurons? Is every moment in the song represented uh, by, those, uh, by a population of those neurons? And uh, in uh, some recent work, um, uh, uh, Tatsukubo and, and, um, and Galen Lynch uh, collected and analyzed a very large data set of these neurons showing that uh, as a population, so this shows the bursts of individual HVC neurons sorted in time in three separate birds. And you can see that uh, the song is essentially completely tiled in time. There are some fluctuations in the density, but those are consistent with random placements in time of those neurons. Okay, so the song is completely tiled. And so our basic model for how this works is very simple. These neurons are active at a single moment as a population, they completely cover the song. Uh, there's no evidence for edge-to-edge -edge alignment. It's just convenient to draw it that way in the diagram. Those neurons then activate downstream in RA, a complex uh, pattern of bursts. And at each moment, that pattern of bursts then converges to output neurons in the, in the brainstem to the motor neurons to drive some time-varying level of tension in those six uh, muscles. Okay, so it's very mechanical. It's uh, sort of a music box kind of view of how these, um, how this motor circuit might work. Now, where does that sequence come from in HVC? Uh, one simple hypothesis is that those neurons activate each other in a sequence like a chain of dominoes. Uh, we refer to this as a synaptically connected chain. This was uh, proposed by a number of labs. There are other uh, hypotheses. That, um, that experiments have, have suggested are very unlikely. Uh, but um, rather than, uh, we actually don't think it's one continuous chain in HVC. We think that this feedback loop um, essentially at the end of one syllable uh, feeds back and activates the next syllable in HVC through that feedback loop and also serves to synchronize the two hemispheres of the brain uh, because that projection from DM to UVA is actually uh, bilateral. That's the only bilateral interaction in this circuit. So the idea is that there are these little modules in HVC, each of which generates a single syllable. And those, are, uh, those modules are essentially selected and activated by this thalamic um, input, okay? So that's, that's our basic, uh, uh, hypothesis, the basic conceptual framework by which we think the song uh, is produced. Okay, any questions about that? Because I'll then turn to learning. Yes, um, there's a lot of lateralization in these circuits. Is that what you're asking about? So some, um, some birds um, actually dominantly sing their song through the control of the descending circuitry on the left side of the brain. Other birds actually sing different parts of the song using uh, uh, the left side of the vocal organ and other parts of the song with the right side of the vocal organ. So it's, it's uh, quite complex. There are actually two separate sound sources in the vocal organ of the bird. So they're actually using two separate instruments uh, simultaneously. Okay, and, um, and what one really direct way of trying to uh, see whether there are these synaptically connected chains in HVC is to do dense, electron microscopic reconstruction of the circuitry within HVC to look for evidence of these synaptically connected chains. And we're collaborating with Jurgen Kornfeld and, and Winfred Dank at the Max Planck Institute, uh, together with Varen Jane at Google, uh, who does the, um, uh, the uh, uh, data analysis, the image processing, and, and Mike Long at NYU to uh, test this hypothesis. Please. I mean, it'd be like a bunch of this thing's connected to that one's connected to that one. That's I mean, without right. knowing the function of each, how would you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, each one of these blobs, if you just look at the number of those neurons, 
uh, that type of neuron that's in HVC and the number of distinct independent time slots. Uh, we estimate that there are about 200 of those neurons co-active at each moment in HVC. They're randomly distributed as far as we can tell within HVC. And, um, and so the idea is uh, you would basically have to image those neurons using a functional indicator uh, in, in behavior. And that's, that's the part of this project that Michael Long is doing. And then the idea would be to take that sample of tissue, <clears throat> do a dense a connectomic reconstruction of it, find those neurons, and, and using the time at which they're activated, um, test the hypothesis that basically neurons that are neighboring in time are synaptically connected with each other. <clears throat> That's right. Okay, so now <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about how one might go about learning that, that, uh, that sequential output. So let me just come back to this picture real quick because I forgot to say something. <clears throat> In this model, you can see that HVC is simply a sequence, right? You can produce any song you want. If you have a one second long sequence, you can produce any one second long vocal output you want, you just have to connect the HVC neurons to the right RA neurons to produce the right pattern of tension in the, in the muscle, okay? So the score of the bird song is really in this, um, this uh, matrix of synaptic weights from HVC to RA. So that's the learning problem from the perspective of reinforcement learning. You have to learn how to map, uh, you have to learn how to um, specify, you have to specify what output happens at each time in the song. So there's the state space and the mapping from state to action occurs through these synaptic weights. Yes. Yes, so zebra finches have, have one song. Other birds have more, uh, more songs and, the, and they have separate sequences in HVC for each song. Separate and code neurons yeah, exactly. add, allocated to each separate song. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So how does this uh, reinforcement learning happen? So remember, the bird is trying to learn the synapses from HVC to RA to produce the vocal output. Um, it turns out that in addition to the motor pathway, the bird has a whole basal ganglia circuit, a learning circuit known as the anterior forebrain pathway that's involved in, in learning, okay? And this was shown by Sarah Botcher and Constance Sharp and others who showed that if you lesion any of these brain areas, uh, the bird, in, a, in an adult bird, they sing just fine. But if you lesion those brain areas in a young bird before it's learned its song, the bird can no longer learn its song. It's stuck at the point where it was where you did the lesion, okay? All right, and... <clears throat> So Sarah uh, proposed that this uh, learning circuit somehow programs up or guides plasticity in the motor pathway to drive that system toward a good uh, imitation of the, of the tutor song, okay? Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to show you uh, first is that before we turn to that question of learning, is that um, evidence that this LMAN circuit, this component, let me just briefly say what the elements here are. So LMAN is a cortical uh, component of this. Area X is a basal ganglia circuit. Uh, beautiful work from David Perkel's lab has shown that area X is very much uh, like it's homologous to mammalian basal ganglia. And this forms a cortical basal ganglia thalamocortical loop that's in, uh, very similar to, uh, to cortical basal ganglia loops in the mammalian brain uh, that are involved in, um, in motor learning, habit formation, all kinds of different aspects of complex behaviors. Okay, what I'm gonna show you briefly is that LMAN uh, plays a very important function in that circuit. And that is that it plays a key role in variability generation, okay? In fact, we've proposed that LMAN is actually a, a circuit, a dedicated circuit that generates variability in this behavior for the purpose of exploring motor space for reinforcement learning. <clears throat> okay, so here's one little piece of evidence. Uh, if you take a young bird that's singing this highly variable um, uh, song, this is at the border of subsong and, and, and the protosyllable stage, you can see it's, it's highly variable, but there are some protosyllables in there. And if you lesion LMAN, all of that variability goes away and the bird is left singing highly stereotyped uh, protosyllable. Okay. 
On the other hand, if you lesion area X, you don't see any change in the variability of the, of the song. If you record from neurons in Elman, you see that there are bursts of activity during the subsong stage that actually occur at the onset of subsong syllables. So we think that in red here, you can see these bursts of spikes and in black, you can see the song amplitude. We think that Elman um, somehow initiates uh, uh, subsong syllables um, and, and it does so in a highly random variable way. Okay. All right, so um, Elman is a variability generator that projects to RA. HVC is a sequence generator that projects to RA. And the idea is that young birds start out with the motor system being driven with the variability generator. And then that gradually transitions. The effect of this Elman input gets weaker. The effect of the sequential input gets stronger and the song gradually becomes more and more stereotyped. Yeah. What's the time scale of those subsong snippets that were um, and the, the, the Elman syllable duration distributions are exponential. Okay, so it's it's a Poisson process. Once you start a syllable, when it ends is a is a Poisson process. And the, yep, and the average duration is 100 milliseconds, which is the same as the average the typical duration of adult syllables. Are you telling about HVC driving RA sequences? But if Elman is just doing a moment by moment. Variability, like it looks like the online is driving the whole song challenge. It is in at that very early stage. At that, that subsong stage, at the very earliest stage, before that Elman lesion I showed you, if you lesion Elman, the bird doesn't sing at all. Then if you lesion Elman after you start seeing some of those protosyllables, then you lesion Elman and you just see very stereotyped protosyllables. Okay. Okay, so let me show you what happens if you lesion Elman at a stage where HVC and Elman are converging to produce a variable, but somewhat repeatable song, okay, where you can start seeing distinct syllable types. So this shows um, uh, an example of a song with Elman intact, an example of a song with Elman inactivated with um, Musimol or TTX. And you can see that this particular harmonic stack syllable um, if you take those out and plot those up here, there's Elman intact, and you can see those very large pitch fluctuations. With Elman inactivated, you can see that those pitch fluctuations are gone. And the pitch, um, and here is the residual pitch. So you can see these very large fluctuations with Elman intact, and um, and and most of that variability goes away when you inactivate Elman. Okay, Nancy. Yes, this, these are separate. These are these things extracted out and plotted next to each other. Yes, it, um, inactivating Elman also increases the regularity of the sequence as well. Good eye. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So what I've shown you is that while we have this hypothesis that this circuit um, is involved in programming up the motor pathway. What I've shown you is, is pretty convincing evidence that, that this circuit is also generating variability that drives fluctuations in the motor output. Okay. All right. So let me now show you some evidence that there's actually an instructive signal as part of that output. Okay. So I've shown you evidence that that circuit injects variability. Now let me show you evidence that 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 projection to the motor pathway also contains an instructive signal that tells the motor system which way to go to make the song better, okay? All right, so here's the experiment we did. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> we built a little device that uh, allows us to monitor the bird's song. So there's a little hearing aid microphone on the bird's head. You send that signal away to a digital signal processor that makes a decision about that song and then sends sound back into the bird's head through a little hearing aid speaker that's implanted into the head, into the um, air sac in the head that then has access to the inside of the eardrum. So it's like earbuds, but on the inside of the eardrum, okay? So here's what we do. Um, the, the microphone is picking up the bird's song. We monitor the pitch of a harmonic stack signal in real time. And when that pitch crosses a threshold, we play a noise burst back to the bird. If the pitch trajectory stays below the threshold, we don't play a noise burst, and we place the threshold in the middle of the distribution of pitch trajectories. 
in a position so that the bird gets this feedback noise on about half the trials. Okay, so you could imagine that um, that in exposed to this type of auditory feedback, that those noise bursts would um, would affect the song in a way that the bird would start avoiding those noise bursts. Now you might ask, well, maybe that noise burst is just aversive. Maybe they can't stand the sound. Uh, Jesse Goldberg, who was a postdoc in the lab, uh, when he later left the lab, did this cool experiment where he had birds in a box with a perch on either side, noise burst played on one side, um, thinking, well, maybe the birds would avoid the sound. In fact, they spend most of their time on the side with the noise burst. Okay, so it's not behaviorally aversive, but what does it do to the song? So here's what happened. Each dot here is the average pitch of a particular, uh, of, a rendi of one rendition of this harmonic stack syllable. You can see that there's some a variability in that pitch, but over the course of a few hours, you can see that the average pitch of that syllable drops to avoid the threshold. If you look at the individual pitch trajectories, again, you can see that the pitch trajectories just drop down as a whole so that you very rarely cross the threshold. Okay, now um, the, the question is what role does Elman have in that change in the pitch? So you can see that in the presence of this, um, of this noise that only gets applied to some pitches, to some syllables, you can see that the pitch uh, changes to avoid that threshold. And the question is what is the role of Elman in that learned pitch change? Um, so Aaron Andelman did this beautiful experiment where he um, drove this pitch change day after day in birds and asked what happens. So if we drive that learning in a bird and then inactivate Elman after four hours of learning, what happens to the pitch change? What happens is the pitch change reverts back to what it was in the morning on average. Okay. So Elman, whatever Elman is doing, it's driving a change in the distribution of pitch fluctuations in the direction of improved performance, avoiding errors. And if you inactivate Elman, the song reverts back to what it was before, okay? All right, now there's a lot more of this story to tell and I'm not, I don't have time to sort of give you the full picture, but I wanna kind of give you a summary of how we, um, of, of what these results point to. So the idea is that this is motor parameter space, okay? So here's motor parameter space. If this is time, then the motor parameters are, are going through some trajectory in time. And on a given trial, let's say at that moment, those motor parameters have that pair of values, tension one versus tension two. Elman injects variations so that each time the bird sings, those motor parameters are different. So that's the variation, that's the noise that Elman is injecting. In the presence of an error gradient where these fluctuations produce an error, you can see that the fluctuations get shifted in the direction of improved performance. And we've done experiments that suggest that the motor pathway stays where it is for a day, okay? But then the next day, the motor pathway, meaning the HVC to RA connections have been dragged in the direction of improved performance. So there's this initial change in the fluctuations that Elman generates, and then that gets consolidated into the motor pathway over the course of the next 24 hours. And if there continues to be a gradient in that direction, it keeps dragging the motor pathway in the direction of improved performance. Does that make sense? Yes. In the direction of improved, improved performance, because the noise doesn't sound like the Tudor song, but it's drifting in pitch, and the pitch is different from the Tudor song, so it's not perfect, right? Um, yeah. So let me just let me go back to this picture here. So the idea is the idea is that Elman is driving fluctuations in the output. This circuit is figuring out which one of those fluctuations made the song better, and it's reactivating the, the good fluctuations more often, okay? Good before meant similar to my stored model, and now good means avoiding creating this exogenous error. Yes, but crea uh, creating this noise burst is a big deviation from the model. That's worse than a song than yes. having the wrong pitch. Yes, and, and the, 
this bird has already pretty, it's a young bird, but it's pretty much learned its song. So all of its pitch fluctuations are way closer to the model than this noise burst. That's right. Okay, does that make sense? So the idea is that this circuit is somehow figuring out which direction in this motor control space makes the song better. At that moment, remember that noise burst is targeted to a particular syllable. So at that moment, this, the idea is that this circuit figures out which direction in motor command state space makes the song better or less bad in that case. And then the song, the motor system learns, it undergoes plasticity in that direction. Okay, but remember what this thing is doing is it's activating neurons at a particular time. And so simple heavy and learning can, can do that consolidation process. Okay, because this input is pointing in the direction of this very high dimensional com control space, which direction makes the song better. Okay, yes. You just mentioned high dimensional control space. Is there an estimation on what is the dimensionality of the control space that can be controlled by this learning? Yeah, um, so there are about six muscles on each side of the uh, vocal organ. Um, the uh, the, you know, okay, so there's a question of the resolution of that, um, of that control space so of the, of, you know, that tension parameter, let's say on one muscle. So there might be a hundred effective um, uh, resolution elements in that analog space. And the temporal resolution is maybe 10, five to 10 milliseconds. So those are the relevant numbers. So some, some product of those, those numbers. Does that seem like a reasonable calculation? Yeah. Okay, so how would Elman figure out which fluctuations make the song better and which fluctuations make the song worse? Okay, so it turns out that every axon that goes from Elman to RA has a collateral that goes to the basal ganglion. Okay. So area X, so every axon that drives a fluctuation there, and there are about 6,000 of those neurons in Elman, there are 6,000 collaterals that go to area X. So area X has an image of what that fluctuation, what fluctuation Elman is driving into the motor output at every moment in the song. Now, if only area X had a signal that said whether the song was good or bad, whether that fluctuation made the song better or worse, then X could figure out which fluctuations make the song better and which make it worse. Well, turns out that there is a pathway from auditory cortex to area X that goes through the ventral tegmental area, which is a classic area that is thought to be involved in conveying reward or reward prediction error signal, okay? So we discovered a pathway from auditory cortex through this layer five part of the avian brain down to VTA. And, um, and David Perkel has shown that there is a population of VTA neurons that projects to area X. And so, um, so we wondered whether neurons in this pathway carry error signals. We recorded neurons in this area called AIV that show robust responses to those noise bursts during this playback of these uh, bursts. And Jesse Goldberg recorded from X projecting VTA neurons using antidromic identification to characterize the error responses of those dopaminergic neurons. And here's what, um, here's what they found. So again, antidromic identification using stimulation in area X. If you record from those VTA neurons um, while the bird is singing and on half the trials, you play a noise burst targeted to one syllable. And these experiments were done after the birds were exposed to this random 50% probability noise burst targeted to one syllable for a day or so. If you record from one of those VTA neurons, you see that those dopaminergic neurons exhibit a suppression of spiking on trials where you play the noise burst and an excess of spiking on trials where the noise burst is missing. So, they are showing a decreased response in, to a song that's worse than average and an increase in response to a song that's better than average. And that's exactly the kind of behavior that Wolfram Schultz and others have identified in dopaminergic neurons in primates. 
You get a burst of activity when the outcome is better than expected and a suppression of activity when the outcome is worse. Okay, all right, so now, so there is a signal, a dopaminergic signal that carries performance information, not, not just performance, but performance prediction error signals. And so how would this actually work? So here's our grand hypothesis for how reinforcement learning works in the songbird. You have a song motor pathway, generates a sequence, some activity in RA that drives a song. LMAN injects variability into the motor pathway. A copy of that variability signal goes to area X, the basal ganglia. Area X receives a performance evaluation signal that goes to area X. And now area X can figure out which fluctuation made the song better and which made it worse. Now it has to do that calculation at every moment of the song independently because a fluctuation might make the song better at time one, but the same fluctuation might make the song worse at time 10. So it turns out that HVC sends a, a projection from a population of neurons that carries the same kind of timing information that it sends to RA to area X. Okay, so now area X can figure out which fluctuation at each time makes the song better. Okay, and then um, the idea is that that timing information can then be used to reactivate in LMAN the fluctuations at each moment that made the song better. Okay, and then the idea is that that biased variability then activates the appropriate RA neurons at each moment to make the song better, and that strengthens the appropriate synapses between HTC and RA, okay? So that's the big picture hypothesis. Yes. Great question. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on that in our lab and other labs. And I will try to get back to that at the end. I'll try to reconnect. Um, so the, the, the question there, the kind of really interesting question is, when the bird hears the song, does auditory cortex need to know what time it is? So it's comparing the vocal output that the bird is trying to sing with the appropriate point in the auditory memory of the song, right? And so I'm, at the end, um, I will try to come back to this connection. So there exists a bidirectional anatomical connection here that we think is important for reading out the auditory memory at the right moment in the song. Okay. Bird, you won't get a VTA response. No. Uh -huh. None of those signals are responsive when you just play a song to the bird. They all require that the bird actually be singing. Okay. Yes. This is maybe a question better reserved towards the end. Um, so, so naively, I would imagine for such a sequence learning where there is a tutor song that uh, the bird would use something more like the mammalian cerebellar system to do some supervised learning. So can you shed some light on why the bird apparently choose the reinforcement learning system, which, which is, is uh, perhaps less data efficient and it's, it's harder to learn, you know, higher dimensional uh, sequence compared to using the supervised learning system. Yeah. So there are people thinking about the possible role of the cerebellum in this. Um, there's, to my view, the, the evidence is not terribly compelling at this point. The anatomical connections are barely there. Um, and there's no evidence that I'm aware of that lesions of any part of the cerebe cerebellum lead to song learning deficits um, that can't be explained by more global behavioral deficits. Um, so the question of why uh, supervised learning uh, couldn't be used, uh, I mean, uh, there are some interesting ideas about this, but um, uh, I don't know the, uh, the, the bigger question of why supervised learning would be a less suitable um, answer to this, uh, but uh, it actually sounds like an interesting conversation. Okay, so we have um, uh, developed a very specific uh, circuit and synaptic level model for how that learning could occur. So the idea is that LMAN is active at random times. HVC neurons are sequentially active. VTA is active whenever LMAN activity at a particular time 
leads to a better outcome. And the idea is that if you strengthen HVC synapses after a coincidence of LMAN, HVC, and dopamine inputs, that um, for example, if LMAN activity at time point three leads to a better outcome, then you strengthen this synapse at time point three. And the next time the bird sings, HVC neuron three, time point three, then activates this feedback loop and reactivates LMAN at time point three. Okay, and so this model um, actually has some very interesting synaptic level predictions about how HVC and LMAN synapses interact at the level of uh, medium spiny neuron dendrites. And we're, we're actually doing dense EM reconstruction of basal ganglia circuitry, area X circuitry in the songbird to specifically test those predictions, namely that HVC inputs should land on dendritic spines of MSN dendrites, where LMAN inputs should land preferentially on shafts. And it turns out, so I made that prediction before we did the, um, the e reconstruction, and that turns out to be exactly what happened. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Okay, so now let me spend a few minutes um, talking about how those uh, sequences emerge. Uh, during development, because remember, in order for that reinforcement learning circuit to work, right, you need, you need uh, these temporal sequences, not only to drive the song, but you also need those uh, HVC sequences to tell the learning circuit where in the song you're trying to sing in order to uh, do an independent reinforcement learning process at each time. Okay, that's, that's why this state space is so important. So how does that state space emerge during development? Okay. All right, so, um, okay. So remember, here's the, uh, the development of the song through different stages, subsong, protosyllable, multi-stage and adult. And what I'll do is I'll show you recordings in HVC at different stages of this song development and uh, see if we get a picture of what that development of those sequences looks like. So let's start with subsong, okay? And we're gonna to try to understand how those sequences emerge. So let's start by looking at HVC during subsong. And uh, so Tansa Kubo, when he was a graduate student in the lab, recorded from uh, HVC neurons in subsong using this uh, very 3D printed, very light, lightweight um, motorized microdrive. And what he found is that most of the HVC neurons, these RA projecting HVC neurons, are locked at subsong syllable onsets, just like LMAN. Okay. And if you record, um, if you make a raster plot of when those spikes are active on different subsong syllables, so each one of these, so the red line, each one of these rows are the spikes during a different syllable rendition sorted by syllable duration. And you can see that those neurons are generating a burst prior to syllable onset. So you can write down the time at which that neuron is active prior to syllable onset. You record a bunch of these neurons and plot a distribution of when those neurons are active. And on average, they're active before syllable onsets, okay? So the HVC neurons burst before the subsong syllable onset. Okay, so now let's go to the next stage, protosyllable stage, and record some HVC neurons there. So Tots recorded a bunch of those neurons, and what he found is that um, what he found is that those neurons, even at this very early protosyllable stage, generate a rhythmic sequence of bursts. Okay, so it's like even though those those syllables don't all look the same. There's a single rhythm in the neural activity at 10 hertz as the bird is singing at that early stage. And different neurons are active at different points, different time points within that rhythm. So there's a single 10 hertz rhythm and all the neurons are entrained to that rhythm. Okay. All right. Interesting. Now what happens at this multisyllable stage? Okay. So what's interesting is that the way birds develop new syllables uh, was actually highlighted by Ofer Chernikovsky. I, should, I forgot to put his name down here. Ofer Chernikovsky showed that at this early stage, going from the protosyllable stage where birds have this protosyllable to distinct syllable types, it looks like those protosyllables actually bifurcate. Like 
alternate versions of that protosyllable start looking increasingly different. Okay, so here's a, a, a parameter space, an acoustic parameter space, and each one of those is a syllable. You can see initially there's this big blob of acoustic features, and then as the bird develops, you start seeing two distinct syllable types kind of emerging out of that blob. Okay, now what's going on at the neural level? So here's what we found. What we found is at that early level, you have these, um, you have these, uh, um, you have this really interesting two different kinds of neurons. You've got neurons that are active on each one of those two different emerging syllable types. We call those shared neurons. And you have neurons that are specific for, in, for the individual new syllable types, okay? So shared neurons and specific neurons. And the earlier you go, the more shared neurons there are, and the later you go, the fewer shared neurons there are, okay? So early on, they're all, you know, most of those, those neurons are shared, and then increasingly more and more neurons become selective for one of those two emerging syllable types. And that's consistent with the idea that early on that protosyllable is produced by one big fat chain and every neuron is active at a different point in that chain and that chain kind of loops around, okay? Just kind of runs, the end connects to the beginning and it keeps going. And the idea is that neurons here, they're active on every repetition of the protosyllable, 10 Hertz rhythm. And here you can see that this neuron if you take that big fat chain and you start cutting it down the middle and disconnecting one part of the one half of the chain from the other half, you'll have neurons that start becoming selective for one chain or selective for the other chain. And you'll have some shared neurons, but the further you go in splitting these, this chain in half, the fewer and fewer shared neurons you'll have, okay? So that's the, the, uh, the picture from the neural data, okay? And uh, we also, uh, and let me just make one other point that in this early on in this subsong stage, most of those HVC neurons are active prior to syllable onset. But the further the bird develops, you can see more and more of those neurons are active after syllable onset until in the later stages, they're, they're more uniformly distributed across the syllables. Okay. So this led us to the idea that there is a kind of a growth of chain and then a splitting of that chain into different, different chains for each syllable, okay? And we wondered whether we could actually um, develop a model by which that simple process could actually work. Does that, does that word model make any sense from the perspective of real neuron, well, model neurons connected to each other with model synapses? So we did, this, uh, we did this modeling project. And the idea is that, remember early on, Elman drives RA to produce subsong. Now, remember that feedback loop from RA to the midbrain back to HVC? We think that's the pathway by which HVC neurons get activated prior to syllable onsets in the subsong stage. And now a simple, Hebbian learning rule with synaptic competition that Ila actually proposed in a paper in collaboration with Richard Hanloser. You can take a simple Hebbian learning rule with competition, activate a subset of neurons in a randomly connected network, and they grow a chain. Okay? And then the idea is you simply connect the end of that. Remember, these are projecting to HVC, and the end of that can then reactivate the beginning of that loop and make a 10 Hertz rhythm, okay? So now, how do you actually make multiple syllable types? Well, the idea is that if you have different populations of neurons in the thalamus or um, in another part of the, the brain that connects the HVC, if you have different populations of neurons that act as those seed neurons, I forgot to mention, we call these seed neurons. The idea is that, that these inputs can actually shape the way that, H, that this splitting process occurs in HVC and you can actually get splitting of that chain. And let me just show you what this looks like in a movie that was developed by Emily, uh, a model that was developed by Emily Muscovich, Muscovichus and Hannah Payne as a project at Woods Hole in the 
um, methods and computational neuroscience course. So here we activate those neurons at syllable onset, and you can see that that chain grows. What's that? Why 10 hertz and not 5 hertz or 2 hertz? That's just the frequency. So they, most of them are between 5 and 10 hertz. Okay. Why? I don't know. Other birds sing much faster syllables. So grasshopper sparrows sing syllables at 30 hertz. Um, uh, um, white crowned sparrows, it's more like one hertz. Okay. All right. So then what happens? So now what we do is we take those seed neurons and we activate them in two separate populations. Okay, and watch this, the exact same learning rule that drove the growth of that chain. Okay, that's very sad because it's a really beautiful movie. Basically what happens is you can see these synaptic connections here gradually get broken and you get a basically a splitting of this chain that runs right down the middle so that you get now two independent chains that um, can then serve as the temporal basis for learning two separate, um, two separate song syllables. And we have experimental evidence that those, that you can get hierarchical splitting where you can get splitting of a chain from the initial protosyllable chain. And then one or both of those can then split into subsequent chains for even more syllables. Okay. All right. So I will, um, uh, just very briefly um, turn to the last topic, uh, which I'll just touch on quickly because we're out of time. But basically the question is, how, what is it that controls that splitting process? So remember when birds are born, they don't know exactly what song they're gonna try to imitate. They don't know how many syllables they need to imitate, okay? So there, the growth of those chains, the, the, um, the splitting of those chains needs to get input, it needs to be controlled by the auditory experience that the bird has. And it turns out that there are very strong interactions between auditory cortex and HVC that we and others have hypothesized are involved in shaping the formation of those chains. And, um, and Rich Mooney's lab, uh, and Todd Roberts and others have identified uh, very clear anatomical interactions between auditory cortex and HVC. And we are, um, we are recording in HVC during tutor exposure to try to understand how this auditory input could shape um, uh, HVC during development. We're doing things like imaging um, in HVC, doing functional imaging. Uh, the movies aren't working, it's really pretty picture of neurons flashing while the bird is singing. And uh, uh, to try to understand the, the process by which that auditory exposure shapes the emergence of sequences in HVC. And I think what I should do is stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>